um, I feel very privileged to actually be here and uh, talk about fasting, uh, um, otherwise sort of rather unsexy sort of topic. Um, but I'm very fascinated what nature had in place for us um, when we had sort of bad times. And, um, as, uh, and I will walk you through what, what actually happens uh, when we're fasting. So yeah, so my name is Anja, as uh, one kindly said, and um, I talk about fasting. So I'm a biologist and a physician assistant. Um, and what does that mean? So as a biologist, I'm usually very, very interested in uh, how we can relate our sometimes seemingly unrational behavior to our evolutionary past, and I'd love to make sense of that. But I also went to medical school, so I learned how to you know, put symptoms and uh, tests together, formulate diagnoses, and then find the pill to the ill, and then we are supposed to be healthy and happy ever after. For some reason or the other, while I was at medical school, my biological part or my biological brain was completely switched off. And not once did I ask that question, how on earth did we make it two and a half million years without any medications? So I never asked that question, and I don't know why. So anyway, 10 years post-medical school, I was playing in the emergency department pretty much most of the time, and chronic diseases was not really on my agenda. I considered them boring. Um, but I entered the realm of, medical, uh, of, of general practice, and I realized that medications do not equal health and happiness. So despite me re-prescribing the drugs and giving them more and more and more, it just didn't, it didn't fix anything. So then I started scratching on the surface, <clears throat> and I came across this insulin resistant thing, and I was like, okay. Uh, and I realized that hypertension and diabetes is actually reversible, so despite what I was told at medical school. And weight loss has nothing to do with exercising more and eating less. And through some weird and wonderful, wonderful events, I ended up with diet doctors in the low-carb don't under community, and here are all these answers to that question which I never asked. So I've progressed from there, and then at the moment I'm with the Institute of Functional Medicine and studying uh, functional medicine on top of it to fill all of these little gaps, um, how we can have basically a better, healthy life. So I started with a metabolic clinic, um, and what I'm doing now is basically focusing on a patient's environment, on their stresses, on their diet, uh, on their habits and lifestyles, and I relate that back to how we actually evolutionarily designed, and I realize that's what actually leads to health and happiness. So <clears throat> what do I do in the fasting clinic? So I don't talk about fasting at all, because I realized once I do that brainwashing or unbrainwashing, and I tell my patients, you know what, your muesli in the morning is actually not that great, and uh, the bread is probably not that good, but I tell them, hey, you can have as many eggs as you like, and animal fats are actually good, and you know, cholesterol is actually your friend. Uh, so after I've told them all of that, um, most people think I'm a bit crazy, so just imagining I would add on, oh, you know what, you know, not eating for a couple of days is actually really good. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I just don't leave it. I don't think that anyone would ever come back if I add that on in my first consultation. So I keep it a secret. <laughs> so I lay the foundations first. So when you fast or when you have, uh, or even when you're on a ketogenic diet, you mobilize a lot of fat. Aka, you mobilize a lot of toxins. So I always focus on detoxification and make sure their pathways are well aligned and uh, otherwise the body would probably be flooded uh, with all these toxins that are getting mobilized. Uh, most of our chronic diseases, or most of the misery actually, is coming from impaired mitochondria. So mitochondrial dysfunction is pretty much at the basis uh, of most of our diseases. And we heard about it yesterday quite beautifully. Well, it turns out low-carb, high-fat is the perfect mitochondrial recovery program. So you want to have at least the mitochondria a little bit happier. And then one thing I have learned, uh, being a low-carb practitioner, that if you don't have the adrenals on board, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. So with these adrenal dysfunction patients, I really focus on finding that pause button um, and get the adrenals uh, a little bit in a, in a better shape because fasting is stress. Uh, when someone goes into, uh, you know, or ado adopts a ketogenic diet, it is stress and you don't need any extra. And, and I, I have noticed that if I don't have the adrenals on board, I'm not going to go anywhere. I can put someone on the best ketogenic diet, 
it's just it's just not as successful. So again, we find the pause button, give them some adaptogens, and, and get get the adrenals a little bit better on board. So what are really suitable candidates uh, for fasting? So we all know low carb, high fat really is good for the weight loss, is good for the blood pressure, good for the diabetes, but Sometimes I hit that plateau. So the weight loss is coming down, coming down, coming down, and then people get stuck. So they just, they just don't progress any further. Or the blood pressure. Uh, it's coming down, it's coming down, and you sit on that half a pill out of the original free antihypertensives, and it's just not improving uh, any much more. Uh, or the insulin levels, they're just coming down, coming down, coming down, and everything is great, but then it's just not, it just doesn't reach that level which I would like to see. I also like to have diabetes at that point a thing of the past, um, and we've all learned that diabetes usually just flies off the chart fairly quickly. Or, so I, I, if, if I fast someone, or if I introduce the idea of fasting, I would like to have them off any anti-diabetic medication, so I just feel safer that way. Or the people with chronic pain conditions, yes, they all get better on a low-carb, uh, high-fat diet, but this is sort of a little bit of a niggling sort of leftover. Or cravings. Um, Everyone has to survive Christmas somehow and the family pressures and all of that. And some of my patients just fall off the horse and then they, they, they get into this craving cycle again. And fasting usually just sets a really nice reset button. Or it's great for everyone who just wants to do it just for the fun of it. So <laughs> optimal patients. So what are unsuitable pet candidates? Of course, everyone who's pregnant, um, breastfeeding women, um, small people, including, or teenagers, so everyone who's actually growing. Uh, again, here are my adrenal dysfunction patients. I would not fast them for prolonged times. Um, so when I'm talking about fasting, I'm talking about more than 24 hours. Uh, so beyond that normal intermittent fasting where people are on one meal a day. Uh, so everyone who sort of wants to go a little bit longer. People with uh, severe renal dysfunction, I wouldn't recommend it. And of course, everyone who's got some kind of eating disorder or someone who's extremely skinny already, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, recommend those people just going into a prolonged fast. So, but there will be a time uh, when it's like, you know, shall we just sort of ramp up uh, the system a little bit more? So, most of my patients are on a well formulated, uh, nutrient dense, and clean uh, low carb, high fat diet. The mitochondria, adrenals, and the kidneys should be kind of happy. Um, they don't have to be perfect, uh, but they should be, should be on a sort of in a, in, a, in a good state. It's very important that the patients are comfortable with their new lifestyle. And it really helps if they've been in ketosis, in a nutritional ketosis for a little while. But they shouldn't, they shouldn't struggle with the cravings anymore, and they should know exactly um, uh, how to do low-carb, high-fat diet. The detoxification pathways would be nice if they're up and running. And by that time, uh, most of my patients, they should be familiar to only eat when they're hungry. And it sounds like a very simple concept, but it's sometimes harder than we think, because often they just follow their Pavlov's reflex. And it's the time, the situation, or the place which dictates them, oh, I'm actually hungry. Uh, so people should be familiar with that. Oh, is it just, am I actually hungry right now? Or is it just my, my Pavlov's reflex which I'm following? Um, and if my patients follow those body cues, uh, they naturally end up on either two meals a day or one meal a day. And by that, they don't know that they're actually fasting. They just realize that they can actually survive longer than three hours without food. But we don't call it fasting because it doesn't sound sexy. <laughs> so, so, but then there will be a time said, okay, let's push the reset bet, uh, button. And... Um, in aviation, we it would say it's uh, you know a level D sort of maintenance where the whole plane gets dismantled and we just really really have that complete sort of clean out. <clears throat> so because I don't have a degree in uh, in marketing, I don't know how to make it more sexy. I just tell my patients what's happening, and that sometimes convinces them to actually do a bit of fast. So the ketones, we all love the ketones. Um, so what happens? So when we, when we go into, uh, into a prolonged fast, so the, the lowering insulin levels and the lowering mTOR levels, which are our nutrient sensors, basically telling the body, okay, there's food coming in or there's not food coming in. So that raises the ketone production like massively. Um, yes, that's why it helps if someone is in ketosis before, but that sort of ramps up the ketone production. And why do we love ketones? So it's a very potent hunger suppressor. So no 
If you keep fasting for a couple of days, you're not gonna get hungrier and hungrier. So it's actually getting less and less and less. Ketones are incredibly neuroprotective and we heard about it uh, in the previous days. Ketones are is a really, really clean fuel. So it has significantly less oxidative stress and your mitochondria thank you for that. It's a very potent anti-inflammatory and it's a very, very good mood stabilizer. So we love ketones in moderation. Stress hormones. So one of the concerns many people have, oh, my metabolism is going to go down. I'm going to feel miserable and you know, I'm going to feel lethargic and all of that. No. So as your insulin levels and your BGL levels are coming down, it triggers the sympathetic nervous system and that leads to the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline, which in turn sort of really ramps up the gluconeogenesis and it really uh, ramps up the lipolysis. So it depends on the study, but your metabolism, your baseline metabolism actually goes up by 10 to 12%. So no, you're not going to feel miserable and lethargic and your metabolism goes down. It doesn't happen. And it doesn't make any evolutionary sense. So if our Paleolithic ancestors, uh, if they wouldn't have had anything to eat, which probably happened on a frequent basis because the mammoth didn't come around every day or the rabbit was simply too fast, so we didn't curl up in our cave and feel sorry for ourselves and be completely lethargic. No, actually nature gave you that kick and said, whoa, you better get out there and get that next kill. So your metabolism actually goes up. Growth hormones, so the boys love it. So with, with the increase of stress hormones and uh, BGL uh, levels going down, the pituitary gets triggered to actually release growth hormone. And that's very important because at day two to three, we enter this protein con uh, conservation phase. Um, and that's, again, if you have been in ketosis and you're well-fed adapted, that happens much earlier. But growth hormone usually rises at uh, two days by about 150%. On day three, you're sitting at about 300%. And even if someone does this fast uh, seven days, it, it goes up to 1,000% or something like that. So why do I like growth hormone? So as the name suggests, it stimulates growth. It is heavily involved in cell repair. So your muscles, your skin cells, your bone cells. You want to have a facial makeover, just get yourself some growth hormone, honestly. <laughs> and it boosts the metabolism. So here you have another backup system that your metabolism does not go down. So as we all get older, growth hormones naturally decline. There have been some interesting studies where they took you know, a bunch of healthy um, men over the age of 60 and they gave them an exogenous growth hormone for about six months. Um, and they had a significant increase in lean muscle mass, uh, decrease in adipose tissues. Um, their, thin, their, their skin looked much better, it's much, much thicker. And uh, the bone density increased. So, so growth hormone is really good stuff. However, if you give it as an exogenous uh, uh, drug, it has significant neurological and cardiovascular side effects. So, to all those gym junkies out there, please do not spend your money on growth hormone it's, it's, and inject it. It's, not, it's really not good for you. Make your own. It doesn't cost anything, right? You don't even have to do anything. And these elderly gentlemen, they didn't, they didn't do exercises. The only thing that has changed was the growth hormone. So that's probably the compensation. That's the men don't have estrogen, as we talked about it <laughs> a couple of days ago. And it makes complete sense as well. So... Why would the body consume the muscles um, if they have, you know, if, if if they haven't eaten anything? So it's not that the body goes straight to the muscles, consuming the muscles, because you need to get out there, get the next kill. If you haven't eaten anything for a while, because you know you've just been unlucky, and our Paleolithic ancestors, they they had a couple of you know weeks sometimes not having anything to eat. Well, it doesn't make sense if your body consumes your muscles and then you're even too weak to pick the berry from the nearby bush. So it's not doesn't make sense. So our muscles are well preserved and there's no studies that's actually show, showing as long as you have some of the fat reserves that you're actually losing muscle mass. BDNF, another good stuff. So as the ketones go up, um, uh, we excrete brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, that's wonderful because it actually maintains, uh, it looks after our brain cells. So it's responsible for the survival, for the maturation, and the maintenance of our brain and nerve cells. And it also stimulates growth and differentiation of the neurons and synapses. So it's absolutely excellent. So after just 84 hours, uh, 48 hours of fasting, our BDNF levels go up by 350%. And when you think about it, 
48 hours is not that bad. So if you're on a one meal a day diet, you just skip one meal and bang, you have 48 hours. <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> so again, as we get older, our BDNF levels are declining. Uh, and that really helps to just you know, boost your brain up. So what else uh, increases BDNF levels? And that's light exercise, light cardio exercise, things like you know, fast walking or light jogging. And that again, it makes so much evolutionary sense because what did our ancestors do? Well, they have been exercising every goddamn day because they had to go out there and, and chase the kill, uh, chase the animal. And it wasn't like that they say, to the you know, cave fellow man, say, um, what are we chasing again? Can, can you read those traces? No, you need to stay sharp, you need to stay focused. And that's what we did because we only had our brain. We didn't have any other superpowers. Like we couldn't smell our prey from what distances uh, away. It didn't happen. So you really want to have that sharpness, that sort of focused um, brain to be able to survive. Autophagy. That's a good one. So <laughs> as insulin levels, as our nutrient sensors are coming down, uh, with insulin going coming down and mTOR coming down, um, a process called autophagy kicks in at about 18 hours and it reaches its maximum at about three days. So what does that mean? So autophagy actually means self-eating. So what do we self-eat? Um, so during normal metabolism, you always have these non-functional sort of cell organelles. They're just worn out uh, uh, or, or proteins that are not functioning well anymore. It's just stuff that clutters up the system over time. But as long as we're eating, the food will always jump the queue. So your body will always burn first what comes in and doesn't clutter and declutter. So but the flame needs to keep burning. So what does our bodies do? It just chucks all these old organelles, uh, these, non, these useless sort of proteins, chucks it into the fire, keep burning. Or if they're kind of, if the bits and pieces are still good enough, uh, our body still remodules and makes old things, makes it new. What turns autophagy off? So that's a small amount of glucose and proteins because that triggers our nutrient sensors, insulin and mTOR. So that, that stops autophagy. And that's why I'm not really a big believer into these sort of fasting mimicking diets because the moment you eat something, it only needs to be a small amount. Your insulin and mTOR levels are going up, telling the body, well, stop chucking all of this into the fire. Food is coming in. And uh, as we heard yesterday, so it's, uh, it's fasting or ketogenic diets are very potent uh, for especially sort of new cognitive sort of um, uh, disease, especially Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, and, and yes, if they have amyloid plaques or not, but that sort of autophagy really helps to actually clean that out as well. And if you combine the ketones uh, with, with the autophagy, with the BDNF, I think that's a really powerful neuroprotective combo. And personally, I would think, so every nursing home resident should be on a low-carb diet and should have a, you know, a fasting day or so you know, scheduled in. But I think I would get in trouble with the authorities. So <laughs> just, just by suggesting that. So, but we feed them you know, toast with jam and orange juice for breakfast and keep cluttering up their brains. So that's what we do. Stem cell activation, that's another cool thing. So stem cells are these little non-differentiated cells. So they're coming from our bone marrows and they can become anything you like. So if you don't eat, stem cell mobilization usually happens at about 24 hours and it reaches its maximum sort of, uh, sort of mobilization at about three days. So why is that good? Um, so you basically renew and Studies have been shown that you significantly increase your cellular resistance, especially to toxins and stress, so that's a really good thing. And also, it protects your stem cells. And the most sort of wonderful studies are actually coming out of, uh, uh, out of the oncology, where they fasted patients for 36 hours before they have chemotherapy. So what they found, uh, there have been significantly less side effects, they have been so much more resistant, they could actually tolerate higher doses of chemotherapy, and the cancer cells are weakened. So thanks to the Warburg effect, which we heard about yesterday, uh, cancer cells can't do anything with ketones. They need glucose. They love glucose. They shovel that up, but it's not there because you're fasting and you probably have a nice elevated uh, uh, um, uh, ketone levels. So that's very, very uh, nice. So personally, 
I don't wait until I have established cancer. Why not having that regular clean out and sort of, you know, get a little bit of an overhaul on a regular basis? So it doesn't have to be every day, but, you know, every now and then. Antioxidants is another cool thing. So as our insulin levels and ketone levels are coming down and the stress levels going up a little bit, I should probably mention those stress hormones are not really so much related to stress. They're actually more metabolic uh, uh, hormones in this case, but uh, because stress always sounds a bit stressful. So what, what all these hormonal changes are triggering is uh, uh, transcription factors such as FOXO3 and PPRA alpha. Um, and what do they do? So FOXO3 triggers another cascade of genes to uh, mobilize antioxidants. So there's a huge expression of uh, anti homemade, uh, own body made antioxidants. And it also ramps up autophagy. And PPAR alpha is, uh, is another sort of transcription factor and it suppresses NF kappa B. So NF kappa B is involved in a lots of uh, uh, inflammatory processes. So every time there's an inf inflammation happening, NF kappa B is very active. And suppressing that helps. So after just 58 hours uh, of fasting, uh, it's been shown that you have a significant increase in antioxidative metabolite, uh, metabolites. So your body makes a lot of antioxidants. And who's benefiting from that? So there are all these sort of people with chronic pain conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia. And what do they have in common? Inflammation. And it's been shown that when they fast for you know, a little bit longer, just a couple of days or even longer, their joint pain goes significantly down and their stiffness goes significantly down. And I don't think it is by chance that those people that line up most in front of those fasting clinics where they fast 7, 21 or 40 days, the majority of patients ending up there, they're the ones with chronic pain conditions. It's not necessarily those you know, overweight, metabolically sick patients. It's the chronic pain, con uh, pain patients which are basically filling up the fasting clinics in the world. And it's probably because of that. FOXO3 does more stuff. So again, the hormonal changes. After 48 hours, uh, FOXO3 expression goes up by uh, about 150%. So what does FOXO3 do as well? So it actually activates gene uh, DNA repair. So during normal metabolism, we always, you know, we always have some sort of genetic sort of, uh, or some, some DNA uh, damage. It's the oxidative stress, it's the environmental toxins. So we always have some little bit of a low grade DNA damage. And as we all get older, um, sort of gene instability and DNA damage actually ramps up. But it also protects our telomeres and actually lengthens them. So telomeres are these little caps at the end of our chromosomes protecting our genetic material. And with each cell cycle, every time the cell divides, those telomere ends are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, ending up with you know, the cell death eventually because then there will be a point where the cell can't divide anymore. And FOXO3 has been shown to actually lengthen and uh, uh, protect those, tel those telomeres. And that was an interesting study. So they looked at people over the age of 95, and they, they looked at, you know, at their FOXO3 expression. And they have this sort of gene variation where they found they have significantly higher FOXO3 expressions, which probably leads to longevity, and which makes sense. So if you repair your DNA on a regular basis uh, and you protect your telomeres, you probably grow older. And of course, uh, other studies have shown that people with... Uh, Devastating diseases, uh, chronic diseases, uh, you know, especially things that are you know, related to, uh, to, to destabilization of your immune system, they have much less FOXO3. I couldn't find a study about those people you know, that have been drinking and you know, smoking all their life and eat junk food all their life. All these Mick Jaggers out there, if they have got this gene uh, variation as well, I couldn't find anything. What would be interesting, all those people you know, that do all the wrong things and they seem to be okay and get away with this. So if you're not one of those lucky people who have that gene expression, just fast and ramp up your FOXO3 on the odd occasion and, you know, maintain your cells. So overall, I think nature had wonderful things in place for us. It really turned bad times into good times. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, it's like if you want to rejuvenate, just fast. If you want to be the stronger, better version of yourself, fast. 
if you want to be more clear, if you have more, want to have more mental clarity, if you want to decrease your chances of getting Alzheimer's or, or dementia fast, uh, if you want to decrease your chances of cancer fast, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to do anything. So, and it's actually very easy. And my personal motivation is really like, I try to biohack myself wherever I can. And I want to live as long as possible, as healthy as possible, to just be there for my son for as long as I possibly can. So obviously, like, it's a little, little bit like being in lockdown, right? You can't go anywhere, you can't do anything, you may as well renovate your whole house. So, <laughs> hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>